Okay, today we're going to begin what is going to turn out in our class to be sort of a long slog to develop the supply and demand curve. All right, and that's the standard uh, diagram in economics. You've taken economics before, you've worked with supply and demand. But instead of, like in many introductory classes, a lot of professors will just present the supply and demand curve like in the first week or two. What we're doing in this class is a little bit different because we're going to build up the theory behind supply and demand kind of piecemeal. We're going to keep adding new elements into our model and make it increasingly more complicated. So as an example, today we're going to be taking a look at the consumer side of the market. Those are people that go in to purchase things, but we're going to make a couple of important adjustments today to the model. First of all, we're going to imagine that people don't come to the market with goods to barter for or with, but rather with income, with money. Um, and we're going to think about how they allocate that money between purchases of different products. All right. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to eliminate this notion that there's just one person demanding apples or oranges. Smith & Jones are the only sellers and buyers in that very simple market. But we know that real world markets have lots of different purchasers of goods, lots of consumers, and lots of different sellers of goods as well, oftentimes. All right, so we're going to expand the model by imagining or coming up with a way of keeping track of the demand for individual items by a whole range of consumers, um, an entire market full of them, maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of consumers for an individual product might exist out there. And we want to be able to keep track of their desires for purchases, their willingness to purchase different goods. And in the process of this, we're going to be developing the demand curve. OK. And uh, the demand curve is going to be a way of presenting and displaying all of that information. OK, so this week we're going to work on consumer demand. And today I'm going to talk about the derivation of this more complex relationship for lots of consumers, the so-called market demand curve. And then next time in class on Wednesday, we're going to develop some tools that we can develop and use with respect to consumer demand. In particular, we're going to develop a notion of elasticity, which is a way of measuring sensitivity of demand to different changes that might take place in the marketplace. And we're going to develop the concept and present the notion of consumer surplus, which is going to be a way of measuring the level of well-being that accrues to consumers in a particular marketplace who are buying a product like butter or coffee or oil or what have you. All right, so this week is focusing on consumer side of the market, and the theory is the theory of consumer demand is going to be presented. Next week, we're going to turn our attention to the supply side, the business side of the market, and think about how firms make decisions about what to produce, how to produce it, what resources to use, what it's going to cost them. And we will develop and derive a whole bunch of um, production and cost concepts, uh, which can be used to study and analyze the workings of an individual firm or group of businesses. And from that, we're going to work our way towards the development of a theory of supply and build up the theory of market supply so that we can ultimately, by the midterm or so, put together a supply curve and a demand curve and begin working with that seemingly simple structure. But as you're going to see, it's somewhat more complicated because there's a lot that is assumed in the model that helps us derive those particular relationships. All right, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to ex develop the notion of market demand, but we're going to start by using the construct of kind of a half of the Edgeworth box, if you will, to talk about individual demand and how an individual's demand for a product is going to be affected by various things. Okay. So the first thing is we're, here's the set of assumptions that are going to be built into this model of first individual demand. And then we're going to expand that to imagine there's many, many people in the market, not just one. Okay, so the first big change that we're making is this first bullet point. Okay, so instead of Smith & Jones or a person coming to the market with a product like apples or oranges, we're going to imagine they come to the market with income. And the income is measured in monetary units or in dollars. Okay, so now we've got money in the economy. And we're imagining that a person goes out and works or in some way derives income. And with that income, they then go to the marketplace and they're now have the, the wherewithal to purchase uh, the goods and services that are being, um, that are available for sale. 
All right, now what's available for sale in our more complex world? Well, still, we're going to keep it simple. And we're going to imagine that there's just two goods, oranges and apples. We're going to let QO be the quantity of oranges in the market, QA be the quantity of apples demanded. And here, remember, we're just focusing on the demand side. So economists are very particular about splitting up the consumer side of the market, the demand function in the end, and the producer side of the market, which will generate the supply side of the market. And it will be very important for all of you to keep track of which variables we're talking about are affecting either the consumer behavior or the firm behavior. And either or will be affected by various variables, sometimes both. But we've got to keep them separated in our minds, and then we put them together ultimately in the supply and demand curves that we're ultimately going to derive. Okay, we're going to imagine that each good has a market price. And the price of oranges is going to be noted as PO. We've used this terminology already, and it's measured in dollars per orange. We're going to use the term PA to represent the price of apples, and it's measured also in dollars per apple. All right, we're going to assume the person in question here has standard preferences or desires for apples and oranges. And for our purposes, that's going to mean more is better and diminishing marginal utility. All right, next. We want to write down what's called the budget constraint. Okay, and the budget constraint is an equation showing how a given income can be used to purchase various quantities of apples and oranges. All right, and the budget constraint is written as follows. Take the price of oranges, PO, and we're going to multiply that by the quantity of oranges um, that can be produced in the marketplace, okay? Or, I'm sorry, the quantity of oranges that is demanded, not produced. See, I'm misspeaking. Okay, so PO is the price of oranges, QO is the quantity of oranges demanded by an individual. And if we multiply these two together, okay, we've got noted down here, PO times QO is equal to the amount of dollars spent on Q0 worth of oranges. So as an example, um, suppose the price of oranges is $2 per orange, and let's say that you've got 10 oranges that you're consuming. Okay, well, to purchase 10 oranges at $2 per orange, you multiply the two together and you're going to come up with $20. It's going to cost you $20 to buy 10 oranges, QO worth of oranges. All right, and that's the amount of your budget, if you will, that you're allocating towards the purchase of oranges. All right, and that's going to be part of the income that you have. All right, and where's the other part going to go? Well, the other part is going to go to the apple um, consumption. The PA represents the price of apples measured in dollars per apple. QA measures the quantity of apples demanded. And if we multiply the two together listed down here, we're going to end up with the amount of dollars that this individual spends on apples. All right, now the sum of orange consumption or purchases plus apple purchases has to be less than or equal to the amount of income that we're imagining this person is coming to the market with. All right, now, one of our simplifications here is we're not going to worry about where that income came from, how it was derived, whether the person worked for some other firm, whether they sold goods on the market, whether they're getting it from ownership of stocks. We don't care where that income comes from. We're just imagining somebody comes to the market with some money to spend and then splits it up between the two goods, the only two goods in our story, which they're able to purchase. Okay, so how do we... How do we, what do we do with this? Now, one other technicality. You'll notice that I made the budget constraint at first to be less than or equal. And this technically is deriving or showing the budget set, which is all of the different combinations of oranges and apples that could potentially be purchased with an income I. But a lot of times, in fact, almost all the time, we're going to be imagining that all of the income is spent. All right, and if that's true, then this inequality becomes an equality. And that's going to put us on the actual budget constraint. Um, we can't go any further, spend any more than the amount of income that's available. And so this is going to be the different quantities of oranges and apples that can be purchased using up all of your income I. All right, now what do we do with that? If we let's just see how we would plot this particular equation. And I will note that this is a linear equation, which means it is an equation of a line. We could write this in the form of an equation of a line and get the slope and the, the, um, the intercept if we wanted. 
but we're, we're just going to do it this way instead. Let's do a simple thought exercise or experiment and set QA equal to zero. So that's like coming up here and saying, let's make this zero. And that's going to simplify the equation and say, well, now how many oranges could we purchase QO if we're not buying any apples? Well, the answer to that is found by rearranging this equation. If we're trying to figure out what QO is at the maximum and QA is zero, then we just take this equation and move this PO over to the other side to get this particular equation here. The maximum amount of oranges that could be purchased with your income is I divided by the price of oranges. And that's assuming you're spending all of your money on oranges. QA is equal to zero. All right, so that's going to be one endpoint, and it's going to be the endpoint on the orange axis. Here's our graph real quick. And notice we've got oranges, as, as we measured earlier with Smith & Jones. Oranges, I've got measured in pounds here, but it could be pounds or number. I'm being a little bit inconsistent here, maybe. But here's the intercept here. I divided by PO is going to be the place where the budget line intersects the orange axis. Okay, do the same thing again, but now let's set QO equal to zero. So you come over here to the graph and say if QO is zero, that means we're not consuming any oranges. How many apples could we consume? What's the maximum? Well, to answer that, we just solve this equation, set QO equal to zero, and solve for QA, and we're going to end up with this relationship here. QA is going to be equal to whatever income you come to the market with, divided by the price of apples. And that's going to be the maximum apples that you can purchase with your income. That endpoint is plotted right here, I divided by PA. And that gives us the two endpoints on the so-called budget constraint. Okay, now we can plug in values for I, PO, and PA and check these relationships if you want. But notice that what we've really plotted here is maximum orange production here on the lower right, maximum apple production, and then the blue line connecting the points actually corresponds to all of the different combinations of apples and oranges that this individual could purchase if they split up their income in different ways. You know, so if they spent half of their money on apples and half on oranges, then they'd end up at the midpoint of this demand curve, and they would be purchasing, you know, half of I over PA and half of I over PO as their individual consumption bundle. All right, so all of these different combinations are now possible for purchase for an individual with the income I. All right, next step. How do we maximize utility? Let's take, a note, take note of what the slope of this particular constraint is. It's relevant and it will relate to something we've already done. So if we wanted to take the slope and we picked out two points, call this point A and call this point B, two points on the straight line, and we wanted to find out the slope of that line, the simplest way to do it is to use the rise over run formula. So this distance to zero is the rise, and this distance to I over PO is the run. And if we form the ratio rise over run, the slope is going to be the negative of this here, okay? Then we're going to have the rise, which is I divided by PA, and then we're dividing it by the run, which is this distance I over PO. Okay, well, let's simplify that. We can simplify it by taking the term in the denominator, flipping it around and multiplying it by the top, the numerator. Okay, and uh, that should actually not be, that should be a times now, I got that wrong. Okay, so it's I over PA times PO over I. And then that's going to simplify because the I's are going to cancel out and we're going to be left with minus PO. PO is on top here now. This is times and PA is on the bottom. So PO divided by PA. Okay, so the slope of the budget line is what we have defined previously as the terms of trade. It's actually telling us how many apples, I over PA, have to be given up in order to acquire a certain number of oranges, I over PO, whatever those values are. And the ratio is giving us the terms of trade between the two individual items. Again, measured in apples per orange. Apples per orange. Or pounds of apples per pounds of oranges, as I'm um, actually specifying it on this diagram. Okay, how does an individual with an income coming to the market and faced with the choice to purchase either apples or oranges or some combination thereof, 
how do they decide how to maximize their utility? So we're going to imagine that the, we're going to assume that the individual's goal, behavioral goal, is to maximize their utility. So how would they achieve that? First of all, we imagine they have a set of indifference curves, two of which are drawn here, but there are many more. So we could draw more indifference curves here for this individual, and they would look something like that. All right, well, how would we determine the utility maximum given these indifference curves? Well, we take this family of indifference curves, and we basically find the one that is just tangent to the individual's budget constraint. Right? Because look, if we, if we pick this lower indifference curve and maybe decided to produce at this particular point, well, it's clear that this person can move to this higher indifference curve here by shifting down to this particular point. So this point here can't be a utility maximum. Um, this point over here, similarly, can't be a utility maximum. But this point here is going to give you the ability this individual, the ability to get to the highest indifference curve that's, that's shown on the diagram, okay? And so A is gonna turn out to be this person's utility maximum. We did this exercise already with Smith and Jones, and imagine this is how they were gonna decide how many apples and oranges to consume. So we're still just repeating what we did before, but with the new variable I inserted in here as the income, can, um, to create the income constraint. Okay, so utility maximum is achieved at Q01 and QA1, uh, these amounts measured on the diagram. And we're going to call that outcome an equilibrium. And this is, I'm going to introduce this for the first time here. But we'll talk a lot about the outcomes in the models are often going to be described as equilibriums because we're going to see that if we upset the model in one way by changing some of the variables, we're going to imagine that forces, behavioral forces and decisions are going to move the market back to the equilibrium point as it's displayed in the graph. Okay, so an equilibrium is something where if you push the market or the economy or the individual away from the equilibrium point, there's going to be forces that come in motion that tend to move back to the equilibrium. Okay, and that utility max in this case, or that equilibrium in this case, is going to be the utility maximum point A. All right. Now, we're going to do some exercises with this, and this is going to help us get to our demand relationship, which is where we're heading to today. Okay, the exercise we're going to do here is an increase in the price of oranges, PO. And the implication or the outcome of the model is listed here already. The implication is going to be that the quantity of oranges is going to fall when there's an increase in the price of oranges. Okay, so let's see how and why. First bullet, suppose the price of oranges rises from PO1 to PO2. All right, well, what would that do in the model? Well, notice that PO1 is here as a component of the intercept on the orange axis. We take I divided by PO1 to get this value right here. Well, if PO1 changes, and in particular, if that value goes up to PO2, since it's the term in the denominator rising, that's actually going to reduce. I divided by P, right? So the effect of the increase in the price is that it's going to reduce the maximum number of oranges that the individual can purchase, right? And that's, I mean, that's common sense, right? If the price of oranges goes up and you've got a fixed income, you can buy fewer oranges. And that's what's getting represented on this graph here. The maximum number of oranges has now fallen because the price of oranges has gone up to PO2. All right, well, what about the Apple intercept. The Apple intercept is unaffected because in our story, the price of apples has not been changed. So therefore, I over PA stays at the same point, but I over PO drops to this lower point. And as a result, we get a rotation of the budget constraint for this particular individual. Okay, so now they face a different budget constraint. We could go through the exercise and say, well, now that they have this new budget constraint that's rotated inward, you know, what would be the utility maximum, this here? How would we achieve that? Well, again, we're going to find an indifference curve that is just tangent now to the new budget line, which is locating here at point B. All right, so the equilibrium is moving from point A, and it's moving to point B because of the change in one of the variables, increase in the price of oranges. 
All right, well, if we look at what's happened in moving from A to B, we find that the quantity of oranges in equilibrium has dropped from QO1 down to QO2. All right, and that's what I'm listing here. QO2 falls from QO1, QO falls. All right, and that's the implication of the model now. Increase the price of oranges. We are able to represent that and show that on the diagram that a utility maximizing individual will then respond by decreasing the quantity of oranges consumed. All right, now, I want to highlight something here, just, and I don't want you to worry about this, but I want you to have a little bit of a broader context just for a minute. If you take this um, course again, and you do an intermediate microeconomics course, for example, or you take some specialty courses in economics, one thing that will happen is you might play with a lot of other situations, like where the preferences are not easily specified with these kinds of indifference curves. And you might look at how this outcome might be upset, how you might be able to show different outcomes if you make different assumptions about the nature of the preferences and so forth. Okay, we're not going to do that in this class. Okay, we're keeping kind of standard preferences and telling the standard story. But I want you to recognize that the standard story is sort of what we'd expect to happen most of the time, but not necessarily every time, because there are special circumstances and situations that can often arise in an economic context. Okay, in our course, we're not going to we're not going to go down too many of those paths or roads. We're not going to take tangents and think about different preferences and how we could get different results. So instead, I'm going to display sort of standard results like this one. An increase in PO, a standard model here, is going to cause a decrease in the quantity of oranges. This also should match your intuition. I mean, even if you've never taken an, um, an economics course, you should recognize as a purchaser, a consumer, that when prices go up for goods, you will tend to be discouraged from purchasing them, right? So that's sort of a standard relationship we have, and, but we're displaying it in a much more sort of methodical way with a whole bunch of assumptions in the background that help us know what's necessary, or at least what will correspond to these particular relationships. All right, let's go forward. I want to highlight something that we're gonna use over and over again. And sometimes I'll mention it, and lots of times I won't, but it will always be valid. And it, the term is called ceteris paribus. Some people pronounce that differently, like ceteris paribus or whatever. It's a Latin term. And I'm gonna to explain to you what it means in the context of the exercise that we just did. Okay, so when we change the price of oranges, rises from PO to PO, we normally would say, change the price of oranges, comma, ceteris paribus. Okay, and that ceteris paribus is meant to indicate something very important. It's meant to indicate that no other variable that's affecting the demand for oranges and apples is changing at the same time. All right, so the ceteris paribus assumption is kind of enabling us to do an experiment. We've got the model in front of us, we've got an equilibrium displayed on the graph, and we can do an exercise where we change just one of the variables holding the other variables at their fixed original values. And then we can see what exactly will be the relationship between the change in PO and the change in the quantity of oranges. All right, but we're gonna do that in the context of PA, the, one of the other important variables here, doesn't change. And I, another important variable affecting the outcome, is also not gonna change. And the preferences of the individual, we imagine, are not changing either. So everything else that's affecting the outcome is assumed to remain fixed, ceteris paribus that is, when we change a variable like the price of oranges. Okay, now we also call these kinds of exercises in economics comparative statics. Now the term static is in relation to the contrast to that would be dynamics, where things are changing over time. We have no time built into our model. We've got a fixed equilibrium that comes about. Point number A right here is an equilibrium at the original price. And that's like a static or a non-dynamic outcome because we have not incorporated time into the element here. When do you purchase this? Over what period of time? We're, we're not saying anything about it. Okay, and the comparative statics is 
corresponding to like what I, the term I just used, which is an experiment, okay? We've got a model, sort of like a simple version of the world built in front of us, and now we're gonna play with it a little bit and change some variables, values, and see how that changes the equilibrium. That's called a comparative statics exercise, or I'm using the term quote unquote experiment, just to give you that analogy to what's done in a scientific discipline. Okay, so we're gonna do these kinds of experiments over and over again. We're gonna introduce an equilibrium, then we're gonna change something. We're gonna see how the equilibrium changes. So a lot of the insights and knowledge we're gonna get from this class are gonna be corresponding to numerable comparative statics exercises or experiments that we're gonna be doing. And virtually all the time, unless stated otherwise, we're always gonna be assuming ceteris paribus when we make a particular change in a variable. Now, one way this is gonna affect you is that you've gotta think in the context of the models when you're trying to answer questions. Because if you jump into the real world and say, oh, well, what's gonna happen if you know, the price of oranges increases? You know, an average person might think, oh, well, the price of oranges increased, but you know, maybe my income has gone up at the same time and the price of apples is also changing. So maybe all of those things are changing simultaneously. So what outcome might happen? And if you change everything at the same time, well, the answer is everything can happen. Lots of different outcomes are possible. Right? And so we don't really get anything, any kind of clear recognition of a cause and effect relationship if we try to change everything at the same time. All right? So we don't. We do it very methodically. Change one variable, see how it affects the other variables, and then go forward. And then what we could do in this exercise, we could change the price of oranges. We could change the price of apples, ceteris paribus. We could change income, which we're going to do in just a second, ceteris paribus. And then we can see what outcomes are likely to come about under the assumptions that we've described or presented in the model. Okay, so that's ceteris paribus. Let's do another one. Let's do a second experiment. All right, this time we're gonna look at the effects of an increase in income for the individual. So in the original equilibrium, we had an income value, and now I put a little one next to it to indicate that this is the initial, the first income value that we're gonna be specifying or indicating on the model. We've got income one here, divided by the price of oranges and apples, and that would generate an equilibrium originally at point A. That would be the utility maximum for the individual. Okay, but now we're gonna imagine that income rises from I1 to I2, ceteris paribus. And from that, you should know, oh, well, that means income's gonna go up, but the price of apples, not changing. And the price of oranges, also not changing. So those are the important variables in this model. Also, preferences, the indifference curve structure that the individuals are facing, not changing. All of those are fixed when we change the income from I1 to I2. All right, well, what happens? If I1 goes up to a higher value like I2, notice that that's in the numerator of this expression affecting the position on the apple axis here. So if I1 goes up to I2 in the numerator, that has to generate a higher value. Intuitively, it makes sense, right? I mean, if you've got a fixed value for apples and your income, your spending capacity goes up, well, guess what? You can buy more apples. And that's exactly what's being indicated right here. I can buy more apples with a higher income. And likewise, down here on the orange axis, I can buy more oranges with my higher income if I spent all my money on oranges. But also, I've got the entire budget line here represented has shifted upward and to the right because of the increase in income because I can now buy more apples and more oranges because I'm coming to the market with a higher income. All right? With that higher income, the new equilibrium is represented here at point B instead. That's gonna be the new utility maximum. And we can now derive what the outcome of the experiment is. If we increase income and we look at the graph and see what's happened to the quantity of oranges, we see that the quantity of oranges has gone up from Q01 to Q02. All right, and hence we get this. Increase in income causes an increase in the quantity of oranges that's being purchased or consumed, or I should say demanded by this individual consumer. We say there's a positive relationship between those two. 
Positive relationship means you change a variable in one direction, the other variable moves in the same direction. So it's also a positive relationship if we decrease income, like from I2 to I1, and note that there's a decrease in the quantity of oranges. A decrease in income causes a decrease in quantity. Well, that's a positive relationship because they're moving in the same direction, both negative. Does that make sense? Negative and a negative becomes a positive. All right, now this is a relationship we're displaying nicely in this diagram, but it's only going to come about if preferences are of a certain sort or a certain way. And when economists think harder about this particular exercise, they recognize that this positive relationship doesn't always come about. It comes about nicely on my graph because of the way I've drawn the preferences, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, there is an example of that in the notes that you can look at and just kind of see how that would work out on a diagram like this. All right, well, when there is this positive relationship as being displayed here, we're going to call a product normal. We're going to say a normal good is one which has a positive relationship between income and the demand for a particular product. And so what we're displaying in this graph is the presentation of why goods can be normal in, in, with respect to the income changes. All right, now we're going to move, that's going to be about the last diagram I want you to see using this indifference curve structure. From this point forward, we're going to throw away indifference curves, and we're going to start measuring things in different ways. All right, we're going to be imagining that there's lots of individuals with indifference curves coming together and trading, but that's going to be now in the background. And we're going to represent the market demand for a product a little bit differently. So it still builds on the concepts we've developed with Smith and Jones and now presented with income in this particular consumer demand theory. But things are going to look a little bit different. We're going to, we're going to display things differently. 